This is the Georgia Farm Monitor. Since 1966, your source for state and national agribusiness news and features for farmers and consumers about Georgia's number one industry, agriculture. The Georgia Farm Monitor is produced by the state's largest general farm organization, the Georgia Farm Bureau. Now, here are your hosts, Ray D'Alessio and Kenny Bergamy. The latest ag news and the voice of Georgia farmers. It's who we are. It's what we do. Hi again, folks. So glad you tuned in for another edition of the Georgia Farm Monitor. I'm Ray D'Alessio. And I'm Kenny Bergamy. Coming up on the program, in part two of his look at the Georgia Grown 1237, Mark Wildman introduces us to a man who's mastered the art of muscadine wine, as well as legal Georgia moonshine. Also on the show, she's a national baton twirling champion and former beauty queen, but she credits her family in agriculture as the source of her down-home southern roots. Plus, Hey everybody, Ranger Nick coming up. If you own a pond or know someone owns a pond and have wondered what's underneath those murky waters, this month we're talking about fish health assessment. We're doing some sampling to find things like this. Man, it's all coming up right now on the Georgia Farm Monitor. Well, last week, Mark Wildman highlighted Georgia Grown Trail 37, a scenic highway that runs east to west through Georgia and gives travelers many interesting agritourism stops along the way. This week, Mark stopped by a winery along the trail that not only produces top quality muscadine wine, but also bottles a product that is a little bit stronger. Here just off of Georgia Grown Trail 37, you will find Still Pond Vineyard, where the father and son team of Charles and Charlie Cowart manage their farming operation of muscadine grapes. The vineyard is large and has been established for many decades but it is what they bottle here from these fields that have travelers from all over stopping to take a look. Uh, with those grapes, uh, we produce 18 different labels of muscadine wine and then uh, six different labels of spirits. Here at their store, which is just beside the vineyard, they have all of their products for sale. The Cowarts have been farming this land for a long time and over the years have adjusted their farming operation to meet the demands of consumers. We see people who want to know what they're putting in their bodies, where it comes from and how it's made. And we are always more than happy to uh, take anyone through our whole process and uh, show them uh, how we make our wines, uh, hopefully how we uh, can, can make uh, ours taste a little bit better than everybody else's. And, uh, then uh, into the spirit side as well, uh, you know, the time, the, the personal touch that each bottle that we produce here has. And, uh, you know, we want them to leave here uh, a friend and happy and, and uh, uh, pleased with their products that they bought from us and uh, tell other people about them. In days past, this site in the back room would have gotten you arrested. But the moonshine they produce here is legal. We're sort of going back to our roots. Uh, the, uh, this place is named Still Pond because of the spring-fed pond that's located on the property that we use to irrigate out of, but it's not still because of still waters. Uh, it, uh, it's the, the springs were used for illegal spirit production since Prohibition, and uh, we're, we're sort of going back to uh, uh, our original roots, but uh, we're legal, thank goodness. The Cowart family is very proud of their products and very proud to be on Georgia Grown Trail 37. There's a lot to offer here in southwest Georgia. Uh, we're, we're very rural. Uh, we're, we're sort of scattered out a bunch, but uh, you take a look at that Trail 37 map or you go to one of those meetings, and we have got some very unique people in southwest Georgia that are doing some fantastic things with food, uh, with uh, uh, wines with with a number of things that uh, that you're just not going to find anywhere else. The trail goes on for many miles past Still Pond, and eventually you arrive at the end, which is in Fort Gaines. Then you can pull into George Bagby State Park, check into the lodge, sit back with a glass of wine, juice, fresh milk, or moonshine that you have picked up on your journey, and enjoy the peaceful views. So if you're looking for a good road trip, check out Georgia Grown Trail 37 and take the nice drive through South Georgia farm country. The trail experience is something that we believe helps uh, 
attract the families, it helps to attract uh, the, the retired folks to come. Everybody's welcome, but it's really a wonderful opportunity to relax, uh, get out into the countryside, um, see, see farm operations at work, enjoy some fresh fruits and vegetables, and just the, 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 many, the many things that we have along this trail. Uh, 37, that uh, we just appreciate everybody so much coming down and giving us a look. For the Georgia Farm Monitor, I'm Mark Wildman. All right, Mark, nice job, sir. Now, meantime, the Georgia Farm Bureau recently kicked off their annual district meetings in Douglasville, Georgia. Those in attendance not only received an update on the organization from President Zippy Duval, but also got an opportunity to catch up with some old friends. Uh, while this event provided plenty of food, fellowship, and fun, it also served as a chance to recognize a number of people who put in plenty of hard work over the past year. It's also to recognize the accomplishments of each uh, county, the uh, county leadership, and that includes the county board, the uh, office managers, the CSRs, the agents, all of it. So it's a time to recognize them and reward them. We have worked real hard on membership. Retention and reaching quota has been a major goal for every county farm bureau in District 3 and they all made it and we're gonna to celebrate tonight. We're gonna to celebrate making quota. This was the first of 10 district meetings which will be held all over the state in the coming months. Established in 2008, the Rock Mart Farmer's Market has quickly grown into an institution in Polk County. Not only can shoppers buy locally grown fruits and vegetables, they can do so knowing that their money is staying inside the community. Damon Jones has the story. No matter what you're looking for, be it fruit, vegetables, or even baked goods, you're likely to find it at a farmer's market. And that's especially the case here in Rock Mart, where local vendors have been coming since 2008, not only to sell their goods, but also pass along valuable information to the consumers. So we have about eight to nine vendors, and we can have as many as 14 vendors, and they're all within um, 60 miles of Polk County and um, they all grow what they produce, what they bring to market, including um, a lot of the baked goods and the canned goods. And their goal was to provide a place for a producer only market. They wanted it to be only farmers within the local area. And then as we grew, we noticed that the vendors, the manager, um, the organizers became a source of information for the community. And that's really the beauty of a farmer's market, as consumers can not only buy a variety of things at one stop, but also ask questions to those who have expertise. You know, they would ask us, well, how do I preserve this? How, how do I freeze this? Do you know how to make this? I've never had eggplant before. <laughs> And so we noticed that we became a resource for the community. And rather than denying that, we embraced it. And so in 2013, we decided to become a nonprofit and make that actually part of our mission. If you look around, you'll see there is plenty of interaction between those in attendance as vendors, organizers, and shoppers who all come from the surrounding areas come together for this community event. You know, they, they say that you have about 15 to 20 social interactions at a farmer's market versus only one to two when you shop at a regular grocery store. You know, that's neighbors talking to neighbors and saying, oh, you know, that's cool. I didn't know that was going on in your life. Neighbors helping neighbors is really the lifeblood of a community, and nothing exemplifies that more than a local farmer's market. The more you can buy from your neighbors, the more you're actually helping your entire community because you know, a healthy economy is about flow. It's about where is it flowing. And if it's flowing inside, then everybody's getting to take advantage of that rather than it flowing outside of your community. Helping the community isn't the only benefit these markets provide as it also stocks the freshest fruits and vegetables you can buy in one spot as the items you see here came straight from the farm. And you can't beat fresh. You know, a lot of people don't realize that part of a healthy diet are, are live enzymes. And live enzymes are on the plants when the fresher they are. And so the fresher you eat them, you know, the healthier your diet in general is going to be. And if you don't find what you're looking for at the farmer's market this week, just wait until next week, as you're likely to see a whole new batch of items for sale. It's that type of variety that keeps people coming back throughout the year. And I think that's the main thing to expect from a farmer's market is the surprises. The surprises that you, you know, you never really know what each week is going to bring. You know, there's a, there's a basic construct that's there, but you never really know what exciting things are going to show up at each market. Reporting from Rock Mart, I'm Damon Jones for the Georgia Farm Monitor. 
Damon, thank you very much, sir. Well, up next on the monitor, we're going fishing with Ranger Nick, but we're not using a rod and reel. How experts can safely and effectively assess the size of fish in your private pond when the Georgia Farm Monitor continues. Stay with us. Well, the Georgia Farm Monitor continues now. You know, everybody likes a good fish story from time to time. Yeah, and this month, Ranger Nick and I packed up the fishing gear and headed to a Georgia pond where we not only learn the proper way to handle fish, but also whether this particular pond was producing enough quality size fish. Hey everybody, well, pond management continues to be a topic of interest to our viewers out there, and we want to respond to that. I'm out here in Greensboro, Georgia, joined by Dr. Jay Shelton. You might remember Dr. Shelton from a couple months ago, where we were out sampling this pond, looking at water quality assessment results, sampling with some saning, looking at some of the forage fish that the bigger guys eat. And we promised that we would come back together with Dr. Shelton, and he's with me now. And I want to talk to him a little bit about ways to sample fish in ponds like what's behind me to determine the health of them. Now, the only way that I know to sample fish is with a rod and a reel. Dr. Shelton, talk to us a little bit about more scientific ways that you know of to sample fish. Right. So we uh, do a fish health assessment frequently on fish, just to try and get an idea of the condition of the overall fish population. In order to do that, we have to sample, handle some fish. Okay. We usually use electrofishing, which simply means we put a mild electric pulse in the water. It causes the fish to swim towards the boat. We dip them out of the water, get some lengths and weights on those fish, and we can release them very quickly. So it, it, this pulse, it's almost kind of like when you go to the doctor and they, they do some things with your muscles. Is that right? I mean, I, I get nervous going to the doctor, but it doesn't really hurt me. In fact, it might even cause less stress to the fish than when I'm reeling them in with a rod and reel. Is that true? This is a way to minimize the amount of stress and to do this assessment as quickly as we possibly can. Wow. So once we get these fish, now let's take a look and find out about their weight, their length, and ask Dr. Shelton if these fish are healthy and show that this pond behind me is healthy. So we had a really successful day out in the pond doing some sampling and Dr. Shelton's got the fish down in this live well. I've got a net that's kind of corralling them. You can hear them back in the corner there. Dr. Shelton, let's pick one of them up out of there and let's do a little assessment on their beautiful largemouth bass. Look at that. He's going to measure the length of this guy for us. Okay, Doc. 15 inches. And he's calling that data out to a partner of his who's taking that information down on a piece of paper. 1.4 pounds. Beautiful. And then Dr. Shelton, you're going to put that guy back and you're going to get another one out and kind of continue this process? That's correct. Very good. And then once you get all this stuff done, you're going to compare that data to some standard data to say, is this pond and the fish in it healthy? That's correct. Okay, so if you're like me, you catch a fish on the side of the bank and you reach your hand down to grab that thing by the mouth, hold it up, put the picture on Facebook. Dr. Shelton, on the other hand, has another way, a healthier way to grab a hold of a fish with their health in mind. Dr. Shelton, walk us through that process if you would. Sure, the key is to minimize stress when you're handling fish. That's especially important in the summer. I want to minimize stress too, <laughs> sounds good. <laughs> well, here's how we're gonna do it. We wanna make sure that our hands are wet before we get started. So we're just okay. gonna dip our hands in the water. Okay. All right. If possible, use a net because it allows uh, you to handle the fish very quickly. Okay. And you can catch the fish. Okay. I'm just going to you can see these fish are very lively. Now, when you're fishing, typically you try and put your hand in the mouth of the fish like right, this. Right, right. Right. And that's great. Okay. That's just fine. Okay. Because now you have that fish stabilized. You can slip one hand under its belly to support the fish okay and then quickly lift it up take that picture Wonderful. and then slip it right back into the water and dr shelton i've heard is there a way that we want to put them back in the water do you want to put them back in kind of with their mm -hmm. face in first kind of get the water going over their gills what do you recommend that's right you want to make sure that the water is passing freely over the gills of the fish when you put them back in the water okay so head first is the best way to put them okay. in the water and do it rather gently allow yeah. the fish to swim away on its own as okay. opposed to just tossing them back in okay did you see the size of some of those fish that we got out of this pond incredible stuff dr shelton you got some lengths some weights on some of this fish where do we go from here All right so we're going to pair the data that we collected today to standard weights, which are a huge set of data from all over the state of Georgia. Um, we're going to see what those fish weigh relative to, to what they should weigh. 1.2 pounds. And that pounds. will tell us something about the overall health of this pond and the overall balance between the predators and the prey. Are they getting enough to eat? Mm -hmm. 
So I got to ask, you've looked at the data. What do you recommend we do from here? How is this pond? The weights of the fish are a little lower than we'd like them to be. Okay. And so we need to give them something else to eat. So the options would be to grow more forage, to grow more food, or to stock more forage, to stock more uh, food for those fish to eat. Okay, and by forage you mean smaller fish that those bass and other things are going to eat. Any particular size on that yeah, forage? Specifically, we want to add more or grow more fish into that three to five inch category with, okay. because that's the typical food for the average adults. Interesting. And if you're at home wondering, look, I've got a pond, I'd like to do some sampling like we did today, do a fish health assessment, get a hold of your county extension agent. Ask them about a fisheries consultant who can come out and do the kinds of things we've done today, take a look at the fish, and even make some recommendations like Dr. Shelton did. Doc, I really appreciate you hanging out with me today. Y'all, yeah. thanks so much for watching, getting this guy back on with us. We'll see you right back here again next month. See ya. Nick, great job as always. Thank you. Now, she's won it all, beauty queen, national champion twirler, and now Ag Scholarship recipient. Our one-on-one -on -one feature with UGA extraordinaire Jameson Kennerly when the Georgia Farm Monitor continues. Stay tuned. Uh, 4-H began uh, in Georgia in 1904 when G.C. Adams started the Boys Corn Clubs with 151 boys. The whole idea was to try to get young uh, youngsters to take home some uh, better corn seed to plant beside their daddy and improve the crop, uh, hoping that daddy would pick up on the idea. Mary Crestwell was um, the first woman to receive a degree from the uh, University of, or a, bac a bachelor's de degree from University of Georgia. She became the assistant director of extension uh, or served in that role from 1918 to 1932. Of course, uh, she was also the first dean of, of um, home economics, now family and consumer sciences, and of course, Cresswell Hall on the University of Georgia campus is named for her. Uh, she and J. Phil Campbell uh, led the 4-H club program in this state, and beginning in 1910, they had 350 members. By 1920, they had 27,000 members uh, in the 4-H club program. And of course, J. Phil Campbell uh, was the second state 4-H leader in Georgia. Uh, he began as state 4-H leader in 1910 when the Smith-Lever Act was passed in 1914. He became uh, the director of extension, so he was the, actually the first director of extension uh, and it was the second state 4-H leader. Uh, in 1948, Bill Sutton was, a, uh, was serving as the fourth state 4-H leader of Georgia. And around this table, uh, he created the, uh, uh, the Georgia 4-H Foundation, a private 501c3, to receive the private dollars to, for the building of a state 4-H club center in the central part of the state that would house a 1,000 boys and girls. And uh, Mr. Harry Wingate, who was president of Farm Bureau at the time, was one of the um, uh, first uh, member of the first board of directors of uh, the Georgia 4-H Foundation. The Rock Eagle Park was actually a, a public park that was opened, uh, that the state operated on these federal lands. Uh, of course, Rock Eagle gets its uh, name from the White Quartz Effigy Mound that's here. Uh, there are two such configurations east of the Mississippi River. Both are here in Putnam County, Georgia. Uh, we're one of the few states in the country that still has in-school club meetings where our county agents and 4-H associates go into, uh, into schools and deliver club meetings. We have over 9,000 kids that attend summer camp at our facilities throughout the year. We have over 40,000 young people who attend our 4-H environmental education program during the school year where young people literally come and become residents. Uh, there's more time on task in a day at Rock Eagle or one of our 4-H centers than there is um, in an um, in actual classroom. And all our programs, uh, every program that we do in 4-H as well as environmental education is uh, uh, in sync with the common core of the Georgia performance standards. And along the way, we hope we can uh, drop a little knowledge in their head about agriculture and about the need for a sustainable and productive agriculture so that we all can continue to eat uh, and have clothing and good homes. Well, it's too early in the football season to predict what the Georgia Bulldogs are going to do, but we do know one University of Georgia student that has captured one national title for the dogs. The champion baton twirler says she wants to thank the folks connected to Georgia agriculture. 
Back in July, Jamison Kennerly, a Wayne County native and a recent Agricultural Sciences Scholarship recipient, beat out 75 other college and university competitors in South Bend, Indiana. She claimed the title of National Collegiate Downfield Champion. I competed there for the first time when I was just five years old, and this past summer was my 15th consecutive year competing there, which was just crazy to even think about. I can't believe how quickly it's flown by. It's been such a huge part of my childhood and my upbringing. Um, for the past two years, I competed in the collegiate division, and this past year I was able to bring back to Athens the National Collegiate Downfield title, which was a huge honor, and the whole UGA community has been so welcoming and so excited for me um, for that win, so that was really exciting, and it's a whole different experience competing as now a collegiate twirler, not just as, a, as, an, as an individual like I did growing up, but representing the dogs and bringing that home to them. I was recently so excited to get a letter in the mail saying that I had won a department scholarship from the Department of Agriculture and Environmental Science. I'm a biological science major, which is under that department. And being able to receive that $2,000 scholarship, I've actually won two different ones under the department, has been a huge help. My dad is obviously very excited about those, and they really do help. I'm one of four children, all in college right now. So being able to ease the burden on my parents has been a real blessing. I've grown up with um, just fields all around our house. I think agri agriculture is such a huge integral part of our society, especially being from South Georgia. I think I've really grown to appreciate that. But now being in Athens at such a larger university, being able um, to say, yeah, I'm from Wayne County, one of the largest producers in the state, and even making crops for people all across the nation is exciting to say. And then being in these classes for agriculture and them saying, I'm from Jessup, and m usual people would never know what that is. And they'll say, but these people, my agriculture friends will say, oh yeah, I know where Jessup, Georgia is. Kennerly's talents placed her second out of 64 for the National Collegiate Solo Championship too. And there's one more title to mention. Jamison is the World Open Strut Champion. She said she gets her talents with the baton from her mother. My mom had a huge impact in that. She was actually a UGA majorette back in the day, I'll say. Um, she was here in some of UGA's glory days. Herschel Walker was the star when she was here. She went to three sugar bowls during her time as a majorette. When my sister and I were born, she was actually teaching baton and dance at a local studio. And as soon as we could, we were growing up and grabbing those batons as soon as possible. And the rest is history. We've loved it ever since. And my sister and I both are now twirlers here at UGA, a dream of ours since I can remember, and that's just incredible, really. A junior this fall, Jamison is a biological science major and said after she graduates, would like to practice medicine. As far as what is most important in the champion baton twirler's life, she said faith and family are at the top of the list. I'm so thankful to um, come from a home where I'm the daughter of two parents who are still in love and married to one another, which is such a rare thing in today's society. I'm number three of four children, all of whom are born within five years. And the way we are able to remain so close to each other, I mean, there were some serious fights growing up, but being able just to fall, just to fall on those people now, um, I have one sister and two brothers who I can honestly call my best friends, is just a real blessing. And um, we are all, and we're all Christians and are so thankful for the blessings we've been able to receive, all being in college, which so many people take for granted. We're really thankful for that. And I think that we're all going into fields that we can hopefully give back um, for all that we've been given. Yeah, very bright girl. You ever try a twirling baton or no, just mess around with one? I have no talent. It, not as easy as it thinks. No, but watching her, it's it's quite the art form. Yeah, it takes years and years to uh, learn how to really get it down, and uh, certainly she shows that. And on that note, we will close out the books on this week's edition of the Georgia Farm Monitor. Here's just a reminder for all the latest ag info regarding food, great recipes, and what's happening down on the farm. Be sure and check out our Twitter, Facebook, and Pinterest pages. You'll stay informed and see what's up in the world of farming, plus the Farm Monitor Show. Take care, everybody. We will see you next week right here on the Georgia Farm Monitor. Hope you have a great week.